for the last three weeks we have been studying on the topic you shall have whatsoever you say and this week also we will be continuing on the same topic you shall have whatsoever you say just now we heard the hymn god is good all the time and we are made in his perfect image and in his likeness so we are also all the time good vijay malya you all know him he was also known as the king of good times he is indeed having a good time in the uk whether vijay malya called himself the king of good times or whether the world called him or named him as the king of good times it does not matter he got whatever was prophesied he got what the people prophesied the king of good times another practical example of you shall have whatsoever you say is our beloved prime minister 7 years ago when he was contesting for the elections his slogan was acche din aayenge good times will come people were so excited they also wanted a change they wanted good times and they brought him into power and praise god the good times have come we are living in the good times Do you agree with me on that? Good times have come, not for the people, but for himself and for his party. Did he ever say good days will come for India? No. He only said good times will come, and praise God, good times have come for himself and for his party. We need to learn from these examples that there is power in the words. that we speak i'm not against our prime minister he believed there is power in the words he spoke what he believed and he received what he spoke we have all got the habit of speaking about our situations circumstances sicknesses disease problems etc last week i was vaccinated and before getting the shot many people told me that you'll get fever you'll get body ache you'll get this pain and that pain and i said nothing will happen to me and praise god nothing happened to me our words are like seeds which we are planting and we eat of their fruits these seeds the words that we plant they germinate and grow was the roots then the shoot then the stems the leaves the flowers and then comes the fruits proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit the choice is ours there are only two options you either speak life or you speak death whatever you speak you shall have whatsoever you say all these years we have been speaking the wrong words we have planted the wrong seeds and today we are reaping the harvest we are eating its fruits the bible keeps on telling us again and again guard your mouth keep your mouth shut guard your lips psalms chapter there are a lot of scriptures but i'll i've just chosen a few psalms chapter 141 verse 3 set a guard over your mouth keep watch over the door of my lips 
Proverbs 21 verse 23 says, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, do not let any unwholesome, corrupt, negative, rubbish, unnecessary talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Again, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. We studied last week in Matthew 12, 34. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Whatever is there in the heart, in the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. How do you know what is in your heart? By the words that you speak. Again, 1 Peter 3, 10 says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. So do you want to be kings and queens of good times like Vijay Malia, like a prime minister? So what do you have to do? You must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Last week we saw how Elisha led the army of the Arabians into Samaria. He led them to the king of Israel and the king of Israel saw them and wanted to kill them. But Elisha said, don't kill them, but set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So the king of Israel prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. And the Arameans stopped attacking Israel's territory. In God's kingdom, Love and forgiveness is the key to healings, blessings, and miracles. Just as God has blessed us to be a blessing to others, he also had mercy on us so that we may be merciful towards others. We need to forgive others just as he has forgiven us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 onwards, Jesus said, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you your sins. Again, in Mark chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, Jesus is saying, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. We love this verse. It's a blank check that Jesus has given us. Whatever you ask, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But there is a clause. There are terms and conditions that apply. Verse 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So when we forgive others, we are not doing a favor for the other person. We are doing a favor to our own selves. Because when we forgive others, we will be forgiven. And only when we are forgiven, our prayers will be answered. 
So are we ready to forgive and do ourselves a favor? Most of the major sicknesses are caused due to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness in our heart is like carrying a big load. The moment we forgive, we experience the load has gone from off our shoulders. The angel Gabriel spoke to Mother Mary and said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. And Mary asked the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? She clarified with the angel that she was a virgin. She was not married. How could she be a mother? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And he also gave her a testimony saying that Elizabeth, her relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. Mother Mary believed Angel Gabriel, even though she did not feel anything. She just heard the word spoken by the angel Gabriel. And she said in Luke chapter 1 verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. In other words, she said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be done to me according to thy word. And the word became flesh in her and dwelt amongst us. And that word is Jesus. She believed, she spoke, and she conceived. What we believe, we speak. And that is what we conceive, whether good or bad, death or life. Now, when you are pregnant, will you go around telling everyone that you are pregnant? Some who are excited will go around telling everyone. Others will wait till the third month, till the body shape has changed or till the doctor has confirmed. Some doubt, what if I tell now and later there is a miscarriage? People will laugh at me. You shall have whatsoever you say. As you think in your heart, so will it be. When God has blessed you, go and tell the whole world how the Lord has blessed you and how he has been merciful to you. Mother Mary went to Elizabeth's house on foot through the mountainous region to Judea. And she sang the beautiful Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name, for he has done mighty deeds. <clears throat> when Mother Mary reached Elizabeth's house, <clears throat> Elizabeth said, Blessed are you who believed. <clears throat> Earlier, the angel Gabriel had appeared to Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth, and had told him, Your prayer has been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to call him John. And Zechariah said in Luke chapter 1 verse 18. How can I be sure of this? I am an old man. And my wife is well along in years. Mother Mary's question was genuine as she was not married. Zechariah was married but he was old. But if you look in the Old Testament, we have Abraham who was old. 
99 years and Sarah's womb was as good as dead. And so Zacharias's question was not genuine. He doubted God at his word. He spoke negative words and God had to shut his mouth till John the Baptist was born. How many times we have opened our mouths, spoken negative words, fear-filled words, insulting words, and have brought about a block to our healings, blessings, and miracles. We need to keep our mouths shut and open them only to speak words in line with God's word. We need to speak words of faith, words of love, because faith works through love. If we cannot walk in love, our faith is useless. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 3 says, If I speak in the tongues, if I have the gift of tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a, the great, the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship or to be burnt, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So you may have great faith, faith even to move mountains, but if you have no love, you are just an empty vessel making noise. Good for nothing, useless in the kingdom of God. We all love God, but God is saying in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, whoever, whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or a sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And that includes the husbands, wives, parents, in-laws, children, everybody else besides yourself. God's ways are higher than our ways and his plans are better than our plans. When God sent Moses to Pharaoh, he gave him a stick in his hand. He did not give him arms and ammunition or millions of soldiers, but he gave him a stick Supposing you are in the place of Moses and you are sent to the ruler of Egypt to confront him and tell him, let my people go. Would you go to him with a stick? We would have gathered support from other nations and created a bigger army and then would have attacked Egypt. But that is the worldly standard of dealing with it. But look at God's way and God's plan. He sends one man, Moses, with a stick in his hand, as though he is sending him to drive out a dog. Would we have gone? But look at Moses. He believed God and he went to Pharaoh and confronted him with a stick. Did Moses have to fight against Pharaoh? No. Did God give him the victory? Yes. Will he not give us the victory if we believe in his word and set out to do what he tells us? Last week we even saw David go to face Goliath with a stick and a sling and five stones. And Goliath said to David in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43 onwards, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And verse 45, David said to the Philistine, 
you come against me with sword and spear and javelin but i come against you in the name of the lord almighty the god of the armies of israel whom you have defied this day the lord will deliver you into my hands and i'll strike you down and cut off your head and this very day i will give the bodies of the philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals and the whole whole world will know that there is a god in israel all those gathered here will know that it is not by a sword or spear that the lord saves for the battle is the lord's and he will give all of you into our hands david believed that he does not have to fight the battle god will fight for him he spoke what he believed and he received what he spoke the whole israel army looked at goliath and began to tremble with fear at his challenges but david looked at god who was and is the most powerful he confronted goliath knowing that god was with him is the lord with us yes he is emmanuel god with us then why are we fearful corona virus has given everybody the fear corona virus has become like goliath but we need to be like david and say who is this uncircumcised philistine that he should challenge the armies of the living god we should be sure that god is with us and in us we should be sure that jesus is in us and he is greater than the virus in the world than the goliath in this world you remember the movie shole there was this dialogue jo dar gaya sam jo mar gaya the one who gets scared will die and that is what is happening in our lives fear has killed more people than the virus in john chapter 4 verses 46 onwards once more jesus visited cana in galilee where he had turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal official who suddenly sick at capernaum when this man heard that jesus had arrived in galilee from judea he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death and jesus told him unless you people see signs and wonders you will never believe the royal official said sir come down before my child dies jesus replied go your son will live the man took jesus at his word and departed while he was still on the way his servants met him with the news that his boy was living and when he inquired as to the time when his son got better they said to him yesterday at 1 in the afternoon the fever left him then the father realized that this was the exact time at which jesus had said to him your son will live and he and his whole household believed now how long was jesus's ministry in this world just 3 and 1/2 years in these 3 and 1/2 years the royal official had heard a lot about jesus and his faith grew because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god and how long have we been christians 
How long have we been hearing about Jesus? Do we have faith like this royal official? We have been hearing the word of God right from our childhood. Yet we are not believing because we have not understood the word of God. Now we have the Bible studies. We have preachers preaching and teaching us the word of God. Yet most of us do not believe. Because our thinking, our reasoning says, how can it be possible? We are relying on our minds, on our five senses, rather than believing in the word of God. The royal official had left his dying son at home and came in search of Jesus. He was a rich man. He was a royal official. He had the money to get him treated from the best of doctors. Yet he believed what he has heard about Jesus. He came to Jesus traveling a full day's journey. We have pre nowadays we have priests and preachers and pastors with their offices, <clears throat> parishes. We know where to find them. Nowadays we have the emails and WhatsApp and Facebook, etc., where we can connect with them easily. Jesus did not have a fixed place. He would keep traveling from one place to another. Sometimes he was at the lakeside, sometimes by the seashore, sometimes on the mountain. Sometimes in Jer Jerusalem, sometimes in Jericho, sometimes in Samaria, Judea, and all the other places. And there was no transport facilities like we have today. They traveled on donkeys and camels. There were no proper roads. They had to go through dusty roads, crossing hills and mountains. The royal official had to travel more than a day's journey looking for Jesus. And again, he had to go back more than a day's journey back home. But nothing prevented him from coming to Jesus. He must have asked so many people about the whereabouts of Jesus. Finally, when he found him, he fell at his feet and begged Jesus to come and heal his son. Have you seen beggars? They will never leave you till you give them something. The royal official must have gone down on his knees and begged with Jesus. He let go of his pride, his ego, his position, his title, etc. And he begged with Jesus. He's not an ordinary man. He's a royal official. He could have lost his job for following Jesus. The people in those days were no different than us. We also find groups in the churches saying, if you follow that preacher or join that group, you will have no place with us. But look at this royal official. He does not bother about anything. Let anyone say anything. Let anyone think anything, I know Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my healer. He is my Redeemer. He is my Deliverer. I will go to Jesus. I will bow down only to him. I am ready to beg with him. I know he alone has the power and the authority to heal my son. Even though Jesus rebuked him saying, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Yet he pleaded with him with respect. He said, sir, come down before my child dies. And as soon as Jesus replied, go, your son will live. live he did not waste his time, but he left his presence and went back on his journey back home. What was the request he made to Jesus? He had told Jesus, come and heal my son who is close to death. 
but Jesus instructed him to go, your son will live. Now he did not sit and cry and beg Jesus, why don't you come and lay your hands on my son and then he will be healed, etc., etc. He just believed the word of Jesus and he left believing that what Jesus has said will surely come to pass. He was obedient to Jesus' instructions. He believed and he set out on his journey back home. And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy is alive. He is well, he is healed. And when he inquired as to what time, what was the time when his son got better? And they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the father realized that was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, go, your son will live. Now Jesus and the royal official were in a different location. The boy was in a different location. Jesus spoke the word from there and that word went and healed the boy there. We also see this happen with the centurion who comes to Jesus for his servant. Jesus and the centurion were in a different location and the servant was in a different location. <clears throat> Jesus wanted to go with the centurion, but the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, but speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled at his faith and said to all those who were following him, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And Jesus told him, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. The centurion and the royal official <clears throat> took Jesus at his word and they departed. What about us? We have a book full of promises from God, his spoken word. Do we believe his word? If we believe, are we going to ask him to bless us, heal us, protect us, deliver us, provide for us? Or are we going to thank him for all that he has already done for us? <clears throat> Look at this man's faith. He left his dying son and he came to Jesus. He could have gone to the best of doctors but he chose to come to the creator that is Jesus. We are ready to go everywhere, but we don't want to come to Jesus. That is our last option. We are ready to go for pilgrimages to Nasik, to Wellingtony, Portugal, Spain, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, but not to Jesus, the word of God. I have seen our own Christians going to the Dargah and other places of worship. Why do they do that? Because they are not sure that our God is living and he is able to do all that he has promised. They are taking chances. If not our God, some other God will help us. And thus they go hop, skip and jump to all the other gods. Satan has deceived us by saying, you go here, you go there, and you will be blessed, etc. We forget that God dwells in us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And when he is with us, who can be against us? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. The same power that God used to create the entire universe, he has given to us to create all that we need. But we have been using this power to destroy ourselves and others around us. The words that we speak create the situations and circumstances around us. Instead of speaking to the situations and circumstances, 
we are speaking about the situations and circumstances and making them worse. When God created man, there was only one language. And all the people were speaking only that one language. We see that in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 and then 4 to 8. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. They said to each other, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heaven. So that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. The Lord knew that he has given them the power of words to create things. The people believed. They said, they spoke, and they got into action. And this brought God down to see what they were doing. And God must have said, Today, if they are building a tower to reach heaven, tomorrow they might take over heaven. They might take over my throne. So God came down and confused their language and scattered them all over the earth. And they stopped building the city and the tower. They were building the tower to make a name for themselves. Their desires were selfish. And so God confused their language so they could not speak to one another and build the tower. Again, we see Abraham. God had blessed him with a son at the age of 100. And now he wants Abraham to offer his only son as a burnt offering. Abraham had already seen God do wonders in his life. And one of them was making him and his wife Sarah the father and mother of many nations. Abraham set out in obedience to offer his son as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice. No second thoughts. He did not even consult his wife. If God has said offer, just offer. No questions, no discussions as to why he wants him to offer him up. Probably we would have thought it is Satan speaking to us and we would have said get behind me Satan. We would have informed our wives, consulted with our family members about what they should they think they should do, we should do. We would have sent messages to people, keep us in prayer. God is asking us to sacrifice our son. Please fast and pray that God may change his mind. Let's storm the heavens. But look at Abraham. He does not tell anybody, not even his wife. And in Genesis chapter 22, verse 3 onwards, early the next morning, that means God must have spoken to him at night, maybe in his dream. He could have easily ignored it, thinking or saying that it was a bad dream. If we were in Abraham's place, we would have surely said, thank God, that was a dream. Praise God, I don't have to sacrifice my son. Verse 3, <clears throat> early the next morning, Abraham got up 
and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. He did not sit and cry or complain, grumble or murmur against God. He did not question God. If you wanted to, me to sacrifice my son, then why did you give him to me in my old age? There was no questioning, just obedience to God's instructions. Abraham set out to do what God had told him to do. We are not able to do anything when we think a lot. When Abraham reached Mount Moriah, verse 5, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Why is he saying we and not I? He is going to offer his son as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice. He had faith that he would come back. He knew for sure that his son would come back alive. Even if he has to offer him up as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice. And what gave him that faith? That his son will come back. God had spoken to him in Genesis chapter 21. Verse 12. God had said to him. Do not be so distressed. About the boy and your slave woman. Listen to what Sarah tells you. Because. It is through Isaac. That your offspring. Will be reckoned. It is through Isaac. That you will be the father of many nations. This promise of God gave him the faith that his son would definitely come back. And he spoke what he believed and he received what he spoke. He told the servants, we will come back to you. He knew no matter what, even if I sacrifice my son, God will have to raise him up from the dead to fulfill his promise to me. He was sure God was a faithful God who keeps his promises. And with that confidence, he told his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. He spoke what he believed, he spoke what he wanted, and he received what he spoke. You shall have whatsoever you say. How many times we speak disasters over our lives and bring death and destruction over us. So many times we have made not only our lives miserable, but also of our loved ones. We have troubled them till their death. And then we pray, may his soul rest in peace. All through their lives, they tore them to pieces. And now they pray, may his soul or her soul rest in peace. Because now they are worried. Their spirit might come and put, tear them to pieces. It is high time. We changed our words. Now as Abraham and Isaac went on together. Genesis chapter 22 verse 7 onwards. Isaac spoke up and said father. And Abraham replied yes my son. And Isaac said. The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb? For the burnt offering. 
And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Again, Abraham spoke what he wanted. He spoke what he believed and he received what he spoke. You shall have whatsoever you say. If we were in the place of Abraham, what would we have answered Isaac? I'm sorry, son. You are the lamb for the burnt offering. You are the Bali Kapakra. You will be sacrificed today. But look at Abraham. He had just one scripture to back him up. One promise. And he believed God. He spoke what he believed and he received what he spoke. Don't use your words to describe your situation. Use your words to change your situation. Abraham did not need anybody to pray for his situation. He did not speak about his situation. He spoke words that changed his situation. If you are going through any situation today, look at the words that you have been speaking and make correction. Change the words to change your situations and you shall have whatsoever you say. Verse nine, when they reached the place God had told him about. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, is it easy for a man of about 113 to 119 year old to bind his teenage son and lay him on the altar? <clears throat> Isaac is not a small boy. Soon after this incident, Abraham is looking for a girl for Isaac. But look at Isaac. He is obedient to his father. He is the exact representation of Jesus who willingly embraced the cross with joy. Abraham took the knife and was about to slay his son. When the angel of the Lord called out to him, Abraham, Abraham. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Verse 13, and Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. It happened just as Abraham had spoken. He had said, the Lord will provide. Abraham did not have to run after the lamb. The lamb was caught in a bush of thorns waiting to be sacrificed. Again, the exact representation of Jesus, the Lamb of God, with a crown of thorns on his head, ready to be sacrificed. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. 
when we let go of things that is in our hands god lets go of what is in his hands many a times we want to hold on to small things unnecessary things and our hands are full to receive what god has in store for us but when we let go of all that we have god blesses us with all that he has in store for us god fights our battles we do not have to fight them the only fight we must fight is the good fight of faith 1 timothy chapter 6 verse 12 says fight the good fight of faith take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made good confession in the presence of my witnesses what is that good confession the words of agreement to god's word that we speak is good confession jesus said by my wounds you were healed now you agree with that word believe that you are healed and you shall have whatsoever you say ephesians 1:3 says you have already been blessed with everything that you need now you believe it you agree with it and you shall have whatsoever you say the things that we are seen the things that we see are temporary after the darkest night there is a day everything has to pass away 2 corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 says while we look not at the things which are seen but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal can you see me can you see others on the group because we are temporary we are temporary on this planet earth but our life in heaven is eternal forever because we walk by faith not by sight we believe in the unseen not in the seen if you can see it praise god it is temporary no matter what sickness disease situation or circumstance you see it is all temporary tell that sickness tell that disease tell that situation tell that circumstance tell that virus tell that goliath i can see you you are temporary healings blessings miracles long whole satisfied lives are eternal jesus gave us the authority to speak to things like the mountains the trees sickness disease situations etc if we have to go to the graveyard what do we find there a well full of bones dried up the graves are full of dry bones can we speak to those bones and tell them to come back to life can we speak to those bones in the grave open up and come back to life if jesus has said you can do greater things than what i have done then surely we can do it sometimes god tells us to do certain foolish things he told noah to build a boat an ark in the desert there was no rain no sea and god wants him to build a boat noah could have said to god why do i have to build a ship i have so many ships camel is also called the ship of the desert and he was in a land where the camel is used as a ship to cross the desert but again no questions asked noah got to work he built the ark and we all know what happened one man noah with the help of his family built the ark in the desert it took him almost 100 years to build the ark it looks foolish to us but the bible says man's wisdom is foolishness to god god's ways are higher than our ways and his plans are better than our plans so let's close our eyes for the final prayer Abba Father, thank you for your word today. 
Thank you, Lord, for giving us the same power through which you created the universe. Thank you for giving us the same power by which you raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you for the gift of your only son, Jesus, who took our place on the cross. Thank you for restoring to us all the power, authority, and dominion over all the earth. Thank you for teaching us to take authority over our situations and speak to them and it shall obey us. Thank you for teaching us to speak words, to change our situation rather than to speak words to describe our situation. Thank you, Jesus, for dwelling in us and for being with us always. You are our good shepherd and we shall not want. For you, O Lord, supply all our needs according to your riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your written word, the Bible. We are what it says we are. We have what it says we have. We can do what it says we can do. Today we have been taught the word of God. We boldly confess that our mind is alert, our heart is receptive, and we will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen.